windows, we are happy that you're here and we're excited for this morning with you as well. Okay. But yeah, thanks for joining us today. If we've met before, my name is Pastor Pete. I'm one of the pastors here at Resurrection Church. And we're going to be continuing our sermon series in the book of Habakkuk. We're going through verse by verse uh, the book of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk, as we've been talking about, is a little bit different than other prophets in the Old Testament. Other prophets receive a word from God and they speak that word to the people. This one's a little bit different because he is actually having a conversation with God. And it's almost like his prayer journal. And then we get to peer into and see the conversation he has with God, okay? And so over uh, the last three weeks, we've been going through what this conversation looks like. And it started in Habakkuk feeling that God was silent and distant, and then God responds to him, and then he has a problem with what God responds with and says, ah, I don't really like that. God's like, hey, the Babylonians are gonna come and they're gonna conquer you because of the injustice that you guys are doing. And he's like, but they're worse than us, God. That's not the answer I was looking for. And then last week, we talked about how God says, you know what, I'm still in control and I'm, my glory is still going to be the thing that fills the earth, okay? And so you can know that eventually the Babylonians are going to have to pay for their evil deeds and what they're going to do. And throughout this series, we've seen dis- different aspects of prayer, right? Specifically in evil times or in painful times. How do we deal with God being silent? How do we practice patience in our prayer? How do we humble ourselves as we approach God's throne? And so today, the prayer we're going to look at is actually one of praise and one of petition. And so if you go ahead and open your Bibles to Habakkuk 3, verses 1, we're going to be in 3, 1 through 15. And while you're turning there, I'm going to pray for our time together. Let's pray. Holy God, we come before you and we pray that you would be present with us today. Be with us today. We pray that we would experience your power as we hear your word taught We pray that we would uh, hear of your amazing, mighty acts that you've done to save us and that we would rejoice and that we would praise you for you are a good God. You are a God that draws near to your people. You are a God that saves us in your power. And so we praise you, God, that you are worthy, that you are holy, and that you are strong and mighty to save us. It's in your name we pray, amen. So I'm a pretty big Lord of the Rings fan, okay? I'm not the biggest fan, so please don't quiz me afterwards if you're a Tolkienite nerd. I'm not claiming to be that. But I am a fan. I've read the books, and Steph and I watch the trilogy regularly. Uh, And one of the main reasons I love Lord of the Rings is Tolkien's deep sense of hope. The story is all about how when times look dark, when the battle looks lost, the heroes look defeated, good still wins. And throughout the Lord of the Rings and the history of Middle Earth, right, hope and darkness are kind of this cyclical motion back and forth. Evil and good keep pushing each other back and forth. And so what you see is good men, women, elves, dwarves rise up and they'll defeat evil. They'll push the darkness back. But almost always a new evil will arise and they'll slowly build their forces in in secret and then they'll try to conquer Middle Earth again. And so you'll have like a thousand years of peace and then 300 years of darkness and so on, back and forth, back and forth. And throughout the history of Middle Earth, when there's these times of war, normally what always happens is a mighty king or a mighty warrior would come and be raised up to defeat the emerging evil. They kill the enemy, and then when they do that, they bring peace. Okay, so that's exactly what Aragorn represents uh, in The Return of the King. So for those of you who have not watched the greatest trilogy ever filmed, may God have mercy on your souls, this is Aragorn. Okay, Aragorn is the brave, strong, virtuous warrior who is the leader of the fellowship trying to destroy the ring of power. He is a swordsman full of courage, charging into battle to defend those who he loves, right? In this scene, he's the famous phrase where he turns back and he says, for Frodo, and then he charges at the enemy. And so while Aragorn is helping fight the evil forces of Sauron, rumors start circulating, right? People start talking And there's this prophecy that one day a king will return to reunite the kingdoms of man and bring peace. That a descendant of the last great king, Isildur, is going to come back and he's going to save the world. 
And that's exactly what happens, right? Aragorn does help destroy the Ring of Power. They defeat Sauron's forces, and then they reunite the kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor. And so at the end of the book, and the end of the movie, as evil is defeated, Aragorn is crowned king, and the people celebrate. Our good, righteous king has come to save us. And this concept isn't new, right? This concept is not new. All the great epics throughout human history have this battle between good and evil, and there's normally always a mighty warrior winning the battle. In Homer's Iliad, Odysseus and Achilles pushed back the Trojans. In British mythology, King Arthur defended the people from the evil Mordred with his own life, but also is going to be the eternal king, the once and future king who's going to come back to rule over the eternal Britain. In the Chronicles of Narnia, there are whispers of Aslan's return to come and defeat the White Witch, even though he's already defeated the evil witch, Jadis. Over and over again, we see this theme in human mythologies and literature. Good defeats evil, and an upright king, a powerful warrior, is needed to do it. And so humans, I think we as human beings know in the deepest parts of our soul that we need saving from evil and injustice. We are not powerful enough to do it ourselves. And the Bible actually tells this same exact story over and over again. God's people are suffering. They are being oppressed. They are even committing injustice themselves. And so God needs to step in and God needs to send someone to save his people because the people cannot save themselves. Whether a judge, a prophet, a king, or a leader like Moses, God enters the battlefield, so to say, and he saves the people that he loves. And so in our text today, we're going to see exactly that. Habakkuk 3 is, is actually a psalm. This is a written psalm, just like in the book of Psalms. And this psalm was most likely sung during temple worship. And so that's exactly what a psalm is. A psalm is just a singable, singable prayer. And so Habakkuk actually writes it this way. And in this psalm, Habakkuk is recounting the power of God, the mighty ways God has already saved his people. And then he's going to ask God, come do it again. Come in power once again. Come to actually save your people who are going to be oppressed by evil. And so with that, let me go ahead and read our passage for today. I'm going to read the whole thing through. This is Habakkuk 3, 1 through 15. This is a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. Lord, I have heard the report of what you did. I am awed, Lord, by what you accomplished. In our time, repeat those deeds. In our time, reveal them again. But when you cause turmoil, remember to show us mercy. God comes from Timon, the Holy One, from Mount Paran. His splendor has covered the skies. The earth is full of his glory. His brightness will be as lightning. A two-pronged lightning bolt flashes from his hands. This is the outward display of his power. Plague will go before him. Pestilence will march right behind him. He took his battle position and shook the earth. With a mere look, he frightened the nations. The ancient mountains disintegrated. The primeval hills were flattened. His are ancient roads. I saw the tents of Kushan overwhelmed by trouble. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were shaking. Was the Lord mad at the rivers? Were you angry with the rivers? Were you enraged at the sea, such that you would climb into your horse-drawn chariots, your victorious chariots? Your bow is ready for action. You commission your arrows. You cause flash floods on the earth's surface. When the mountains see you, they shake. The torrential downpour sweeps through. The great deep shouts out. It lifts its hands high. The sun and moon stand still in their courses. The flash of your arrows drives them away. The bright light of your lightning, quick spear. You furiously stomp on the earth. You angrily trample down the nations. You march out to deliver your people, to deliver your special servant. You strike the leader of the wicked nation, laying him open from the lower body to the neck. You pierce the head of his warriors, Selah, with a spear. They storm forward to scatter us. They shout with joy as if they were plundering the poor with no opposition but you trample on the sea with your horses on the surging, raging waters. That's a lot, but we're going to go through it in three different sections, okay? So last week, 
uh, we studied the five woes of Babylon, if you were here. And so last week we talked about all the evils the Babylonian empire is going to commit as they conquer nations to, in order to enrich and glorify themselves. Ultimately, they were a culture of pride led by kings and rulers who were only wanting self-glory for themselves. And so Babylon would end up practicing those five evils we talked about. They'd practice extortion, oppression, exploitation, manipulation, and idolatry. And they would do that in order to push other nations down in order to build themselves up. And so if evil and injustice is, think if you think of evil and injustice like a river, the Babylonian culture of pride was the source that it flowed from. And they would go through and, and conquer all these nations in evil. And so what we just read in Habakkuk 3 is Habakkuk crying out to God with confidence to destroy the Babylonian evil and to save his people. And so he is praising God for his power and he is confident that God will save Israel again. Uh, this seems like a different Habakkuk than the beginning of the book, right? When we started this series, Habakkuk didn't have confidence in God. He was questioning him and claiming that he was indifferent towards evil and injustice. But now we see a different Habakkuk. Habakkuk is now confident in God's power. He's confident that God will save his people. And so what changed? Well, Habakkuk was reminded by God last week that God is sovereign, God is in control, and that his glory ultimately will fill the earth. And so Habakkuk is now shifting his prayer from questioning God. He's, qu he's not questioning God's goodness and justice anymore. Rather, he is now praising God for his power and he's asking him, come again and save us. So let's look how this Psalm begins, okay? This is Habakkuk 3.2, this prayer that Habakkuk is writing. Lord, I have heard the report of what you did. I am awed, Lord, by what you accomplished. In our time, repeat those deeds. In our time, reveal them again. But when you cause the turmoil, remember to show us mercy. Okay? Habakkuk is now in awe of God's glory. He's in awe of what God has accomplished. And so he writes of that report and he cries out, in our time, do these deeds, do these same deeds. In your time, reveal them again. And so you might be asking, well, what does Habakkuk want to be repeated? What does he want God to do? Well, he tells us as we continue the psalm, Habakkuk wants to experience three specific things. He wants to experience God's presence, he wants to experience God's power, and he wants to experience God's deliverance. Okay, Habakkuk knows in his heart of hearts that if God is present and if in his power, he is going to save his people and evil will be defeated. And so we're going to see Habakkuk point back to his specific historical events in Israel's history from their past. He's going to do a twofold thing. He's going to praise God for what he's already done, and then he's going to ask God, do it again. So let's start off. Look at verses 3 through 4a. Okay, these verses are all about God's presence. Look at what Habakkuk writes. God comes from Timon, the holy one from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor has covered the skies. The earth is full of his glory. His brightness will be as lightning, a two-pronged lightning bolt flashing from his hand. Okay, what's happening here? This is Habakkuk retelling or describing the story of God's presence coming down to meet with his people, the Israelites. Habakkuk says that God comes from Timon, Mount Paran, right? Timon was the wilderness around Mount Sinai, and most scholars believe that Mount Paran is Mount Sinai. And so this is talking about God's presence coming to meet with the Israelite people in the wilderness. So when God was leading the Israelites out of Egypt, he would lead them through these natural, almost terrifying acts of nature, right? So while they're going through the wilderness, he's in a pillar of clouds by day, and then he's in a pillar of fire by night. And then there's actually a specific moment within Israel's history where they are camping at Mount Sinai, and God comes and speaks to them. He's present with them. Look at how Exodus describes God's presence. Exodus 19, 16, and 18. On the third day in the morning, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud on the mountain and the sound of a very loud horn. All the people who were in the camp trembled. Now Mount Sinai was completely covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it with fire. 
and its smoke went up like the smoke of a great furnace and the whole mountain shook violently. These are all outward signs and displays of God's presence. God uses his creation to show that he is present to his people. So God is in the lightning, he is in the horn-like sounds, he's in the fire, the smoke, he's in the earthquake. And Habakkuk is praising God that he is a God who draws near to his people. He doesn't stay distant, rather he comes down to be with them. Even though God is completely other than us, he is completely different, we are creature, he is creator, that same God wants to draw close to us. The same God who spoke the world out of nothing also speaks to the people that he loves. God drew us close to his people. And so Habakkuk wants him to do it again. God, be present with us again. So next we see God's power. This is gonna be in verses 4b through 6. Habakkuk writes, this is the outward display of his power. Plague will go before him. Pestilence will march right behind him. He took his battle position and he shook the earth. With a mere look, he frightened the nations. The ancient mountains disintegrated. The primeval hills were flattened. His are ancient roads. So this is Habakkuk making a claim about God's power in relation to earthly kings, right? Kings who were wanting to conquer other nations needed to have really nice roads to do it, okay? So if I was in the ancient world, say I was Babylon, and I was gonna come conquer Jerusalem, which is what's gonna happen, well, I need access to roads, okay? I need clean lines of travel to make sure that my infantry, my warriors, all of my weapons can get from point A to point B. And they needed nice roads also for supplies. Hey, I need to make sure that my army's fed. I need to make sure I can have an ongoing amount of food coming to uh, energize my military. And so military leaders and kings would go around mountains. They would choose the easiest path when fighting. So Habakkuk is claiming here that God can move wherever he wants because he's the creator of the universe and has all the power. I love the phrase Habakkuk uses to describe God. His are ancient roads. Your translation might say his were the everlasting ways. The Hebrew is literally trying to convey God's procession, God's traveling, God's roads are eternal, right? Think about this, mountains remain. In, in, in general, think about human, human, our human existence. Think about Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier has been around for thousands and thousands of years and will stay there for thousands more. It's a symbol of longevity. It's a symbol of permanence. When people look to the mountain, you're like, oh, I'm in the Northwest. That's kind of how we describe ourselves is, is that permanent object. But Mount Rainier's permanence is nothing compared to God, according to Habakkuk. Mount Rainier can't even compare to the eternal ways and power of God. That's what Habakkuk wants us to realize. God has all the power. God takes his battle position against evil and shakes the earth. Ancient mountains disintegrate. The primeval hills flatten. God doesn't need a nice path in order to conquer evil. He can trample over the mountains. He can change topography. Ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low that can keep God from doing what he wants. So God can go wherever he wants, whenever he wants, because he spoke everything into existence. God is all powerful and he is waging war against evil. Lastly, we see Habakkuk asking God for deliverance. Habakkuk 3 verses 7 through 15 actually recount God's deliverance from Egypt in the Exodus account. Habakkuk is specifically focusing on how God's power and presence came together in the act of salvation and deliverance. And so he's poetically retelling the stories of good battling evil as Israel was delivered from Egypt. God loves his people. He wants to be with his people. He's powerful and so he's going to save them. Look at verses seven through nine. Right? I saw the tents of Kushan overwhelmed by trouble. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were shaking. Was the Lord mad at the rivers? Were you angry with the rivers? Were you enraged at the sea? Much that you, God, would climb into your horse-drawn chariots, your victorious chariots. Your bow is ready for action. You commission your arrows. Selah. Now look again. This is verses 14 and 15. You, God pierce the heads 
of his warriors with a spear. They storm forward to scatter us. They shout with joy as if they were plundering the poor with no opposition. But you trample on the sea with your horses on the surging, raging waters. These verses are recounting the deliverance of Israel from Egypt at the Red Sea, right? Many of us know that scene. Who knows the story of the Red Sea? There we go. Okay, almost all of you. But we all know that scene, right? God's people have finally left Egypt. They've been freed from 400 years of slavery, and they're walking into the wilderness in faith. They've just been freed from slavery. But Pharaoh has a change of heart. He's like, I should not have let them go. And so he decides, hey, I'm going to take 600 chariots and I'm going to chase after them. And so Pharaoh and his army are charging towards the Israelites. They're charging towards the women, the children, the men of Israel. And the Red Sea is right there. And the Israelites are, what are we going to do, Moses? What are we going to do, God? And in a great act of power, God then uses Moses to part the waters of the Red Sea to let his people pass from Egypt to the Sinai Peninsula. And once all the Israelites make it across, what does God do? He brings the waters crashing down on Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. The Egyptians were chasing after God's people in chariots and Habakkuk 3.15 described God as climbing into a chariot himself, climbing onto his horses and riding the waves as they crashed over the other army. God prepared himself for battle and when all seemed lost, When all hope looked gone, when the Egyptians were about to storm the defenseless Israelites with no opposition, as Habakkuk says, God stepped in and he trampled over that evil army with his surging waters. When all hope was gone, God and his servant Moses delivered the people from death. God delivers. So Habakkuk's psalm and prayer is very simple. God, you are a present God. You are powerful and you deliver your people. Do it again. That's the prayer of Habakkuk. When the Babylonians come and conquer us, when they commit their evils against us, when we are exiled to Babylon, redeem us, God. Be present with us wherever we go. Be powerful for us and deliver us by your might. Habakkuk is praising God for what he has already done, and he is confidently asking God, do it again. Because over and over again, what's the story of the Bible? What's the story of God working in this earth? He delivers the people he loves from evil over and over again. God is faithful. And so Habakkuk realizes I can have confidence in God. When we experience evil, when we experience hurt, when we see injustice, when we live in a culture that devalues human life, that devalues God's design, that devalues the poor and the broken, that traps people in materialism and consumerism, that promotes ultimate freedom and individuality to the point of crippling anxiety, it is so easy to stay where Habakkuk started. God, where are you? Why are you silent? Do you hear our prayers? Do you hear our cries for justice? Do you hear our cries for renewal? It is so easy to stay in our doubt and our hurt. And doubt and hurts are not wrong, right? Habakkuk has taught us that it's okay to bring our doubts and our hurt to God in our, and to have those hard prayers, that, those hard conversations with God. But Habakkuk is now teaching us that the movement of faith is to run back to God in confidence over and over again, that as we process pain, evil, and injustice, we can run back to God and rest in his presence and his power and his deliverance, not our own. Knowing that God is sovereign, that his glory will fill the earth, and that God is good allows us to continually run back to him as we experience evil in this world. Pete Grieg in his book, Mute, Engaging the Silence of Unanswered Prayer, wrote about this very process, and he put it this way, right? He's talking about Andrew Murray, who's a 19th century South African writer, and he says this, right? The power of prayer depends almost entirely upon understanding to who we're speaking, knowing who God is in and of himself. When we are scared and hurting, when life feels chaotic and out of control, it is more important than ever to anchor ourselves in the eternal and absolute truth that we are dearly loved and deeply held by the most powerful being in the universe. 
Let this be the great non-negotiable in our lives, the platform for every other thought we have and the plumb line of our prayers. We need to have confidence in who God is. We need to have confidence that God is present with us, that he is powerful and that he will deliver us. And we can absolutely have that confidence because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Habakkuk 3.13, God, you march out to deliver your people, to deliver your special servant. Jesus was God's special servant. He was the mighty warrior. He was the presence of God on earth. He was the power of God on earth. He came to deliver the captive and set the oppressed free. And so Jesus waged war on our behalf. He came to destroy our greatest enemy, Satan, sin, and death itself. But think about this. Jesus in his battle against evil was separated from God's presence. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus doesn't use his divine power in order to save himself. And rather, Acts 2 tells us what? That Jesus was delivered over to death. And when Jesus died, the whole of earth, the whole of earth all of creation, cried out. The clouds went black, the skies stormed, and the earth shook because Jesus was waging war on our behalf. He was fighting for us. And when all hope seemed lost, when it looked like evil was about to win, when it seemed death had swallowed up the Lord of life, up from the grave, Jesus arose in victory. Acts 2.24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death. And listen to this, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It was not possible for Jesus to be held by death. His are ancient roads. Mountains melt and death itself is powerless in the presence and power of our God. Amen. 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 Every human, every person who sees injustice and sees evil longs for good to win. They long for the good king. They long for the strong warrior. Every child who reads about knights and dragons, every adult who loves a good superhero movie, Marvel movie, right? It's all part of this deep longing we have to see evil defeated. We desire the good king, and ultimately I think humans, we are made to desire Jesus. Jesus is our great deliverer, our once and for all warrior. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords, and we should have confidence in him. We should. Think about this, right? He was removed from God's spirit. He pours out his spirit on us so that we can daily experience the presence of God, right? He doesn't use his divine power, but he gives us his divine power. 2 Peter 1.3 says, he has given us his divine power for everything we need to live a life in godliness. And then lastly, he has delivered us from sin and death itself. Evil has not won and will not win And so that means we can be confident in the presence, power, and deliverance of God ourselves. Was there a little, was, who said amen? What kid said amen? Thank you. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you. Amen. (laughs) But I do want to point out, right? There is something of the tension we live in, in this world where Christ has defeated evil, but we haven't seen it come to completion. We may not see justice in our time. Habakkuk didn't. God destroyed Babylon years and years after Habakkuk died. The Babylonian empire does destroy Jerusalem and they do commit a lot of atrocious evils. But still, Habakkuk was confident that God would eventually, eventually deliver his people. He had hope in God and we have that same hope that no matter how dark things may get, no no matter how much evil and pain we experience, one day, Jesus will return and destroy all evil. Our good king is gonna return and he is gonna make things right. That is the Christian hope. That the truly just king will come and bring complete justice. The loving Lord will destroy all hate. The righteous ruler will come back and reign with complete mercy. All of creation will flourish and all of the angels and all of us saints will praise Jesus' name. 
We will be in God's presence, experiencing his power, praising him forever that he has delivered us from evil. And the beautiful part of that is that we're living in eternity now as we have the spirit dwell in us. And so we can start praising God now, this side of eternity. Remember, Habakkuk wrote this prayer as a psalm. This psalm was most likely sung by the Jewish people at the temple as a part of their worship, okay? So we're gonna do something a little different today, okay? I'm gonna lead, but I'm actually gonna ask you all to join me in singing our text. We're gonna start in verse two, okay? So we're gonna sing it to the text of Amazing Grace. So here we go, ready? No, I'm just kidding. We're not gonna sing Habakkuk. Don't worry, we're not gonna do that. I'm not gonna make you do that. (laughs) But the Israelites did sing this prayer as a statement of hope. They sang this song as a prayer, as a cry from their heart, praying for God's presence, praising God for his power and desiring his deliverance in their life. And singing God's praises with a heart of prayer and with a heart of confidence is one of the ways we fight evil. Augustine, a North African pastor in the early church said that singing praise is prayer speaking forth our love and our hope in God through melody. Our prayers and our praises matter because we are building up each other as we sing to believe in the truth of God, his eternal ways, and we also forming in ourselves a desire for that God, that we love him and that we want him more than anything. When we pray and we sing praises, we are pushing our own hearts to have confidence in God amidst the evil and amidst the hurt and the pain. And so as we sing together as God's people, we experience his presence, we see his power, and we remember his deliverance in our lives. And so we are gonna respond with singing in just a few minutes. And I would encourage you to prepare your hearts to sing with confidence, to sing with faith, believing that our good King Jesus has defeated evil and will return to completely destroy it. Let our singing this morning be a little taste of eternity. And for those of you who don't know Jesus as the great king, for those of you who don't believe that Jesus will defeat evil, I have good news for you. He's already done it, okay? And you're invited into that same work. You're invited into relationship with him. And I guarantee you, more than anything I could ever tell you, he is worth trusting and he is worth praising. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we come before you. Heavenly Father, we come before you on bended knee. We think about the words that we we sang before this sermon. We come to your throne and we kneel before you, God, because you are a God who is present with us. You are a God that has all the power in the world. You are a God that delivers your people. And so we praise you, God. We love you. And we just ask that you would be present with us now. We ask that you would be powerful, that we would see your power as we sing your praises and that we would just praise you for your work on the cross, that you delivered us from sin and you delivered us from death itself. Jesus, we love you. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us so that way we can praise you with our hearts. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen.